But can you believe, can you believe all the stuff that we've gone through? Can you believe all the stuff that we see and hear on the news? All of the anarchy and the rioting and the, and the uh, troubles and the pandemic. Lord, what are you going to do about this? Isn't it time, Lord, that you stop this? Where are you, God? What are you doing? You know, we have found out quickly that we're not in control. We're not in control. These things are out of our hands. Lord, where are you? Anybody remember the poem by William Henley Invictus where he said, it matters not how straight the gate nor the punishment of the scrolls. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. But when his little five-year-old daughter died, he realized he was not the master of his fate. He was not the captain of his soul. And so we need help from somebody above. So Lord, help us. Why? How long? The prophet Habakkuk had those same questions. Lord, where are you? Lord, why don't you stop all of this? Now Habakkuk is the eighth of the 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. To be a minor prophet does not mean that his message is inferior to the major prophets such as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. It simply means that the material is smaller, is shorter. Habakkuk ministered to the southern kingdom of Judah probably about 600, 650 years before the coming of Christ. And there had been a great revival in Judah, in Israel. But through the years, the people had begun to drift away from the Lord God. And there were other, other idols and other gods, and there was immorality, and there was divisions, and there was evil. And so Habakkuk, like us, looked around and asked, well, Lord, what's going on here? Where are you? Can you believe it? Well, our text is Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. Can you believe it? Habakkuk chapter 1, 2 through 5. Now, Habakkuk is the only one of the minor prophets who does not speak directly to the people. At least it is not mentioned in his book. This is more or less somewhat like maybe a dialogue or a journal between Habakkuk and God. And Habakkuk sets forth some complaints before God. And then God gives his answer, and Habakkuk must have written it down. And then he moves on to another question and, and another complaint, and God gives his answer, and Habakkuk writes it down. And somebody had said that the book of Habakkuk begins with a sob and ends with a song. And we'll see that in just a minute. Here is the reading of the word of the Lord, Habakkuk chapter 1, 2 through 5, and I read from the New International Version. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Oh, cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Sounds like today. Why do you make me look at injustice? Now, I know that's on the screen. But if you have an Old Testament with you, or when you go home, you pull yours out, and you get a pencil or a pen, and I want you to circle a couple of words. We've already read them. How long? And the second one is why? And those are the questions of life and the hour. How long, Lord? Why, Lord? When are you going to answer that prayer that I've been praying for years and years? for a situation or a loved one. And why, why are these things happening? Why do the heathen rage? Why do you tolerate in wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. Seems that way today. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. And here's the Lord's answer. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. 
for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if I told you. I am doing something in your days that you wouldn't believe even if Habakkuk, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing because you couldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. How do you reconcile the providence of God to what is happening today? Is there a connection between, between the purpose of God and our choices and decisions? How is the will and the purpose of God worked out in our day-to-day -day mundane experiences as well as the unusual? Well, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a man named Elimelech. And Elimelech and his wife and two sons lived in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means a house of bread. But there was a famine in the land and there was no bread in, the, in Bethlehem, it, that city where the bread of life was going to be born centuries later. So Elimelech took his family from Bethlehem to the country of Moab. Now Moab was the oldest son of Lot. You remember in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, Lot was the nephew of Abraham, Abraham the father of the Jews, the patriarch of the Hebrew clan. And I guess you could say that the Moabites and the Israelites were somewhat cousins, but anything but kissing cousins, because there had been conflict and there had been war between them. But Elimelech takes his wife and sons into Moab for food. Tragedy occurred and Elimelech died. Tragedy continued and both boys died and left only Naomi and her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Not Oprah, but Orpah. Now, Oprah, I understand, was supposed to have been named Orpah, but somebody got the letters mixed up or maybe mispronounced, and so Orpah became Oprah. Well, Naomi heard that the famine was over and so she wanted to go back into Israel, but she knew that it would be difficult for a foreign widow, much less herself. And so she encouraged her daughters-in-law to go back home. And Orpah kissed Naomi and went back to Mama. But Ruth clung to her in loyalty and in love. In fact, there's that great passage in the Old Testament in this love story in the book of Ruth, that we sometimes use in weddings. In fact, I used it back in June at a wedding down in Alexandria. Entreat, entreat me not to leave you or to return from following after you for where you go, I will go and your people will be my people and where you live, I will live and your God will be my God. And so Ruth goes with Naomi back home. Now it just so happened to be that it was the barley harvest. And it just so happened that Ruth was winnowing, harvesting some barley in a field owned by a rather well-to-do farmer by the name of Boaz, who just happened to be a relative of Elimelech. And it just happened to be that Boaz noticed Ruth. And he liked what he saw. And he was impressed. He called her a woman of noble character. And he, he recognized her character. He recognized her loyalty to Naomi. By the way, all this just happened to be, somebody said, coincidence is God wishing to remain anonymous. But God was at work. And Boaz told the foreman of, of his uh, workers, don't bother her. I don't want any any uh, harassment charge against me. I don't want any harm to come to her and let her, let her glean some of the, of the harvest. Leave some for her and let her even drink from some of the water jars that my other workers have. In fact, tell the women who work for me uh, to leave some of the grain for, for Ruth. That, that was part of the Old Testament law the law of Moses, that the poor and the, the foreigners were to be allowed to follow the harvesters and to glean some of the, of, of the grain for themselves. Ruth came home one day and uh, Naomi asked her, well, where, 
where were you today in what field? She said, oh, I was in a field owned by a man named Boaz. Goody, goody, said Naomi. Boaz just happens to be a relative, the, the kindred redeemer, as it were, of her husband, her deceased husband. This kindred redeemer type thing. You can read about that in the 25th chapter of Leviticus, but basically, if a man died and had no children, his next of kin, probably most often his brother, was to marry the widow and raise up children to carry on the name, the lineage of that deceased brother. Or if someone had gone into debt so much and the family had lost their property or, or their possessions that the next of kin, the kindred redeemer, was to buy that back for that one, for that family. That happened to be the case of Boaz. And so Naomi said, now, Ruth, I mean, Ruth, this is what I want you to do. It sounds strange to us. She said, I want you to put on your best clothes. I want you to put on some perfume. I want you to look your best. And I want you to go out there where they are winnowing the grain. And when Boaz has finished and when he's had all he can eat or drink and he lies down fat and sassy, I want you to come and I want you to lie down at his feet and uncover his feet. Now, that sounds kind of strange. That must have been some sort of ritual of marriage. There's nothing sinister in it. There's nothing immoral implied in it. There's nothing sexual about it. Basically, she was going to ask, Boaz, would you marry me and would you redeem me and Naomi? Well, he woke up and he saw her there and he said he recognized it was Ruth. He said, you go on home and tomorrow we'll talk about it. Well, when they got together again, he said, Ruth, I have some news for you. He said, there's somebody else who's closer in kinship to Elimelech, your father-in-law, than I am. And he has first choice in redeeming you and Naomi. So he talked to this relative and the guy said, okay, I can buy back Naomi's property. And when he told him, well, you're going to have to marry Naomi, I mean, uh, Ruth, and, and, and raise children, he said, I can't do it. I cannot do that. That will harm my estate. So Boaz said, I'll do it. I'll be the redeemer. I'll be the, the kin, kinsman redeemer. Coincidence or not? And so you know how the story concludes and how Boaz married Ruth and they had a son named Obed and Obed grew up and had a boy named Jesse. And Jesse grew up and he had several sons, and one of them was named David. And David became the king of Israel. And through the line, the lineage of David has come our spiritual kinsman redeemer, the Lord Christ. And if you were to look at the very first chapter of Matthew, the first few verses, that genealogy that we always skip over, there's that list of all of those in there. And usually they wouldn't even recognize in, in documents, a woman. But there are four women listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and one of them is Ruth. And so that story concludes with a reversal of the family tragedy at the beginning. For the providence of God is seen behind every scene, weaving together the circumstances and choices of each character. And that story beautifully explains how the, the sovereignty, the, the power, the will of God interplays with the human decisions and choices. God is still at work, as that story illustrates, still at work, perhaps behind the scenes, but still at work, weaving together the faithful obedience of His people to continue His great work of redemption in this world. It's not over yet. Now let's come back to Habakkuk, the starting place of this message. Habakkuk questioned God like we do, and it's okay, but Habakkuk was beginning to learn something when you turn over to chapter 2, verse 4. 
He said, see, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not right, but the righteous person will live by his faith. You heard that before? Paul the Apostle quotes that very verse from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The just shall live by faith. God is sovereign, my friends, but by faith we must cooperate with Him. I think I said the last time I was here that faith is believing that God is here among us even when nothing good seems to be happening. And so you come to the end of Habakkuk, and if you'd come to the, to the third chapter, there's his prayer, he's had a song, and he concludes by saying, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen or cattle in the stall, yet I will still trust in the Lord. He is my strength, he is my redeemer. If everything ceases, if it's all wiped away, there's still the King of Kings, there's still the Lord of Lords, and He is still on His throne doing something that we couldn't understand if He told us. He's not finished yet. My strength is not in some government. My strength is not in what little money I have. My strength is not in any kind of knowledge or power. But my strength, our strength is in the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who says, I change not. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just keep holding and trusting. I'm glad, I'm glad, I appreciate, I appreciate, Pat, uh, you leading us and praise team in those two songs. Love lifted me, and how great thou art. There are a lot of new songs. There are a lot of uh, good ones. But let me tell you something. I'm worried about something these days. I'm worried that our children and grandchildren will grow up not knowing and hearing these great old hymns of the faith because you know what? That is where you and I get most of our theology in the songs and the hymns that we hear. I like a lot of the new ones too, but just thank you for intermingling some of those. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Can you believe it? Yeah, you can believe it by faith. Our Father in heaven, we're trying to grapple with faith today. We thank you for the hope and the promise that is ours in the work that you are doing in and through and around us, even if we can't understand it or explain it. Thank you you've not finished with each of us. Thank you that you have not finished with this church. Thank you that you're still Lord. Thank, and we pray for this world and we pray for this country and we pray, O oh Lord, in the name of the living Savior. And it's amen.